Good afternoon and a warm welcome, especially to our civil society friends, to this CSO dialogue with ADB's President Massa. I am Chris Morris, head of ADB's NGO and Civil Society Center and your host for today. Let me quickly explain the flow of today's session. Following some brief opening remarks from President Massa, there will be a dialogue with four civil society organizations who currently work in ADB's operations. This will be followed by a moderated Q&A using questions from an online call uh, that um, for, we reached out uh, to civil society organizations over the last six, six weeks uh, um, and collected a, a number of questions. Um, but participants joining us today will also be able to, uh, if you're registered and on the formal annual meeting site, uh, to raise questions in the Q&A feature. Please vote or like questions as you see them, as we hope to show the most interesting ones uh, and have a dialogue with the president, um, time permitting after the uh, initial session. I encourage you to focus your questions on policy issues for the president. Should other issues be raised, my team will try to get back to you um, at a later stage. And now it is my privilege to request President Massa to provide his opening remarks. President Massa. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I'd like to also extend a warm welcome uh, to all our civil society organization partners uh, to the 54th annual meeting. Uh, this is actually the second time that ADB is holding its annual meeting virtually uh, due to the constraints of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, last year, as you, uh, you may remember, uh, we couldn't have this uh, in a meeting with you. Uh, I'm sorry about that uh, due to the emergency you know, uh, situation. But uh, this time, uh, we are very glad uh, to be able to organize, in addition to our formal uh, business sessions, a civil society uh, program. So this year, the annual meeting uh, theme is Collaboration for Resilient and Green Recovery. This theme uh, provides an opportunity for us to reflect on how ADB and CSOs can continue to collaborate towards a resilient and green recovery uh, for our region. I hope that all of you will actively participate in the discussions, especially uh, those organized by our CSO partners over the next three days. We recognize the COVID-19 pandemic has forced many, many uh, changes on our lives, personal and professional. Going virtual has increased opportunities for online dialogue, but this has also brought challenges. The di digital divide has widened, uh, creating communication gaps uh, with grassroots organizations and our vulnerable and marginalized stakeholders who are not connected. We do rely on CSOs uh, to help uh, bridge these communication gaps. Despite the limitations posed by COVID-19, CSOs have maintained engagement in our operations and policy work over the last 12 months, both for tackling the crisis caused by COVID-19 and for addressing long-term development agenda. For example, ADB is pioneering a program are to engage CSOs to reduce the impact of COVID-19 through demand-driven community-led interventions targeting the poor and vulnerable. Funded through a $2 million grant from the Japan Fund for Poverty Reduction, uh, the project supports five CSO consortia in Armenia, Cook Islands, Lao, PDR, Mongolia, and the Philippines to expand their ongoing COVID-19 interventions on community-based crisis mitigation, social protection programs, and livelihood support for communities affected by the pandemic. Another example is in Nepal, where ADB's Youth for Asia team has supported the ADB-funded Bagmati River Basin Improvement Project by working with Nepalese youth-led CSOs engaging with young citizens 
across 20 grassroots communities. Local youth have successfully raised awareness to promote three R. Those are reduce, reuse, and recycle of community waste to improve the local environment and contribute to the SDGs. Let me draw your attention to the emerging opportunity of collaboration. As many of you, ADB is helping our developing member countries procure safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and deliver them efficiently and equitably through our $9 billion new financing facility called APVAX, Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility that we announced last September, uh, December, sorry. In parallel with our efforts, I accept, expect that CSOs can raise community awareness and address vaccine hesitancy. Given that there are many CSOs that work as good health service providers at grassroots level <clears throat> in many developing countries, CSO can be an important force to ensure that safe and effective vaccines will be delivered to the most poor, marginalized, and vulnerable populations. And of course, CSO can also play an important monitoring role to ensure accountability and help to control any misuse of funding. Going forward, I also want to continue to identify opportunities to engage more systematically with CSOs in our country operations. For example, in Mongolia, where our new country partnership strategy, CS CPS, is under preparation, we have pledged to step up efforts to increase engagement with CSOs to strengthen project design and implementation, improve beneficiary feedback, implement social and em environmental safeguards, and enhance gender in inclusion. ADB will also deepen its work with CSOs in Mongolia through the Civil Society Advisory Committee, which was established in 2019 to ensure that our strategy, programs, and projects are evidence-based and reflect grassroots level priorities and needs. We also appreciate CSO's active participation in a number of ADB's policy reviews. The reviews of our safeguards policy statement, <clears throat> the energy policy, <clears throat> and the disaster and the emergency assistance policy are well all ongoing. In the case of the safeguard review, we have decided to extend the review period to 2023 in order to ensure uh, there is a, a adequate time for in-person meetings with grassroots stakeholders. On the other side, uh, the uh, energy policy consultation have attracted a lot of interest I would like to thank CSOs for the constructive and proactive engagement in the consultations to date. We have noted the concerns around fossil fuels, waste to energy, and safeguard impacts of geothermal and large hydropower projects, among others. Uh, please be assured that we will carefully consider these elements as we continue our consultations and complete our new policy by COP26 in November. The energy policy and the wider climate agenda are of primary importance to us at ADB. <coughs> the total climate financing from ADB resources from uh, 2011 to 2020 was 36 billion US dollars. We have two ambitious climate financing targets in strategy 2030. One is to reach 80 billion in cumulative climate financing for 2019 to 2030. And another one is 75 percent. <coughs> 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 Sorry. And another target is 75% of our total number of operations will contribute to either or both mitigating or adapting uh, to the climate change. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, 
both mitigating while adapting to the climate change impact by 2030. Let me make it clear that ADB keeps unwavering commitment in achieving these targets. ADB is also developing implementation guidelines. <coughs> <coughs> that will enable our operations to align with the goals <coughs> Mr. President would you like to take a short break or have a drink okay I'll be right back sorry yes uh, <laughs> uh, thank you uh, let us let us just uh, uh, wait a, a couple of minutes uh, um, it seems like uh, President Massa has something uh, uh, upsetting his uh, throat, throat for a while. Um, I'm just getting a message through actually from uh, the production team that one of our CSOs, um, we were hoping to have four CSOs on board with us uh, today. Currently only three are, are, are connected. Um, we hope uh, uh, the fourth will be able to join us uh, um, in a before we, we finish the uh, event also. Um, we'll give, uh, I do want to say uh, hello and, and welcome for those who are also following the event on Facebook uh, Live and also on, on YouTube, as well as the official uh, ADB uh, annual meeting uh, uh, channel. Mr. President, are you, are you comfortable? Sorry, right. something happened to myself. I'm terribly sorry for that. Indeed, it is, is my <laughs> most surprising. Please, please continue uh, with your okay. remarks. All right. So, uh, guidelines. ADB is also developing implementation guidelines uh, that will enable our operation to ally uh, with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Our climate initiatives are fully in line with the priorities of the upcoming uh, COP26 being hosted by the UK. So, in closing, I'd like to uh, thank uh, once again uh, uh, you, uh, CSOs, for your active involvement and participation in the development of Asia and the Pacific. I trust that you will share your rich development experiences and expertise with peers and partners uh, in the next three days. And I look forward to the day that I will be able to meet many of you in person <laughs> once this pandemic is over. Thank you, and I'm now happy to take your questions. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, President Massa. Um, let me now uh, quickly introduce the uh, representatives. As I say, we have three CSOs with, with us. Uh, um, um, first, from, from Pakistan, we have uh, Munaza Rubab who's a project officer with the Association of Gender Awareness and Human Empowerment, an NGO from the Punjab, uh, Agahe. Uh, we have two representatives from the NGO Forum on ADB, uh, the international convener, Hamantha Withanaj, and the executive director from the Forum, Ryan Hassan. Um, I'm very pleased to see Catherine Casudio uh, with us today. She's the Executive Director of Worldwide Fund for Nature, that's WWF Philippines. Um, we were also hoping that uh, um, the Global President of ISEC joined and maybe she will come in later if we resolve the te technical uh, issues. Each CSO will introduce themselves and their organization and share a little bit about the work they do in partnership with ADB and have the opportunity to ask uh, okay. the President Massa a, a question. So it gives me great pleasure now to uh, start off this session with uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Rubab uh, of Agahe. Um, over to you um, to uh, ask, uh, uh, introduce your organization and uh, address the President, please. Uh, Rubab, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Sayyid Damun Azharabad, Project Officer from Agahi. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in this dialogue with ADB, ADB Pradri Massa. 
uh, Agahi Foundation is the Association for Gender Awareness and uh, Human Empowerment. Uh, it is a non-government social and development organization in Pakistan, established in 2007, working with VN to uh, create an enabling environment for vulnerable segments of society where they can utilize their full potential for improvement in their lives and have equal opportunities to safeguard their rights. Uh, Agahi supports uh, communities in the areas of disaster risk risk reduction resilience and governance uh, water sanitation and hygiene health and nutrition and sustainable livelihood uh, now agahi is implementing adb ta 9329 promoting urban resilience climate change resilience in selected asian cities through community led projects this project is funded by the adb through the urban climate change resilience trust fund that is called uccrft and it is a worth of 150 million trust fund administered by adb under the uh, urban financing partnership facility managed by the urban sector group in sdcc with financing from the rockefeller foundation and the governments of uh, switzerland and united kingdom the goal of this project is to promote community led initiatives Activities as an essential component of effective urban resilience projects. Uh, the project has processes that support the empowerment of vulnerable communities to integrate their needs um, and uh, aspirations into local adaptation and resilience uh, planning and actions. Agahi supports the community-led projects being implemented in Sialkot, Punjab district in Pakistan, in partnership with Oxfam Pakistan. In Mubarakpura, Sialkot, the uh, community have decided to develop a green park to help address the problem of raising temperatures and to provide inclusive and safe green community spaces for women, children, elderly, poor and vulnerable members of the community. Agahi is supporting the ADBTA by ensuring effective community engagement and continuous coordination with city authorities and stakeholders and lead community focused activities. Uh, my question for the ADB president is climate change adaptation interventions are needed and necessary at the grassroots and community level, for example, the Basti and Mohalla in Pakistan. What is the role of local governments in speeding up the implementation of climate resilience activities at the district level? And what is the future strategy of the ADB to strengthen climate resilience at uh, community level? Thank you. Okay. Shall I respond, please? Uh, please, Mr. President, respond directly. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rubabsa. Uh, this is a very important question about uh, the intersection of climate action and uh, social development. Um, the situation of the poor and vulnerable in the face uh, of climate change is uh, one of the main uh, reasons why ADB commits uh, to climate-related targets in our strategy 2030 uh, that I mentioned in the opening remark, a 75% target and 80 billion cumulative. You know, climate uh, financing amount. Uh, but the building community uh, resilience is very, much, very much essential uh, if uh, we are to genuinely support people in tackling uh, the critical and immediate threats of climate change. So we have been uh, working extensively on community resilience uh, through the uh, so called Urban Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund. Uh, which is uh, one of the many metrics funds uh, for several years uh, where we have been working uh, with organizations uh, at the community level, such as yourself and uh, here, uh, Pakistan, and your partner organization, Oxford, as well. ADB has recently launched uh, the Community Resilience Partnership Program, CRPP, which aims uh, to further expand climate adaptation uh, interventions at the local level. And, and we are now are seeking for possible donors uh, for this very important uh, program. Uh, in general, our experience shows uh, there are three principles we need to follow. First, we need to build the resilience of, of the poor and the marginalized women and men. For example, uh, we will invest in climate smart agriculture uh, that improves water management and harvesting techniques and builds capacity of women farmers, women farmers to use climate information for crop planning purposes. Uh, second, 
finance has to reach the hands of the poor and especially poor women. Uh, this means using methods such as conditional cash transfers and targeted microfinance. And thirdly, it is vital that we strengthen uh, governance processes, including participatory uh, planning, uh, budgeting and monitoring, and the meaningful participation of citizens in resilience-related decision-making. So this approach uh, to uh, localizing governance and the decision-making process is also preparing uh, our work on uh, localizing the SDGs in general. About two thirds of the uh, 169 SDG targets involve subnational governments, uh, as you know. So we will work uh, with uh, local uh, governments to build capacity to help them uh, accelerate uh, their progress at a local level to achieve other uh, SDGs and with citizens to monitor progress and ensure services meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you for your, your very important question. Okay. Thank you, uh, President Massa and uh, Rubab from uh, Agahe. Um, certainly very valuable work going on at a community level in ADB's urban projects in the, in the Punjab. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us. Um, so I, I would now like to call upon uh, Hamantha um, from the NGO Forum um, to introduce your organization and pose your questions to uh, uh, President Massa. Hamantha. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Um, I'm from Sri Lanka um, and uh, greeting from the NGO Forum and ADB um, in the occasion of 54th annual general meeting. And thanking you, Mr. President, for giving us the opportunity to raise our concerns. This is our first meeting with you since you took the office. Um, I thank ADB for keeping this tradition, for uh, having the meeting with uh, the civil society during all these ADB annual general meetings. COVID-19 pandemic is still ongoing. ADB historical negligence on public health infrastructure, access to public service and social protection is also a contributing factor to the current crisis in the member countries. ADB continue to finance fossil fuel projects, including coal, gas, and energy policy 2009 is not aligned with Paris 1.5 degree goal. More and more climate refugees are clearly visible in the member countries. Global debt has risen, risen to $263 trillion and COVID-19 recovery loans of $20 billion US dollar, climate finance $80 billion US dollar are also impacting the national debt and inequality. Persecution of human rights and environmental defenders and losing civil society space is a major concern for us. We see how the military coup such as Myanmar is killing people who voice for democracy. We commend ADB on freezing all loans to Myanmar as per March 2001 official announcement. The ADB 20, in 2021 is reviewing energy policy 2009 and soon to review the safeguard policy 2009. Both policies as well as following the co-labor standards will prove to be pivotal in setting the region on the path to green recovery. The theme of this year annual meeting is collaboration for resilient and green recovery. This can never be achieved unless the fossil fuel industry, private sector, governments, and the multilateral banks, including Asian Development Bank, urgently heed the call to limit the warming temperature of the planet. To this end, under your leadership, Mr. President, we want to flag following three issues. Since 2014, ADB has no longer invested in any new coal projects. Can ADP thus commit to complete withdrawal from new and existing coal finance as recommended by the IED on Energy Policy 2020? Question number two, as for of 2019, gas is the leading contributor to the global fossil emissions. Whilst coal emissions is, are, are declining, ADB continue to be the second largest gas financier with the support of the fossil-based consult, fossil bias consultants in the member countries. Can ADB commit to a limit bound uh, phase out from gas finance in line with the Paris 1.5 degree target? ADB still affirms support to 
thermal waste to energy systems. Can ADB show real climate leadership by excluding thermal waste to energy from all its financial investment in instruments? Can ADB commit to assessing prioritizing viable solar and wind solutions as energy solutions and thereby removing large hydro and geothermal projects from being classified as renewable energy solution? I will ask the other three questions later. Okay, uh, thank you, Himansa Saha. Uh, so you asked me uh, three questions. Uh, one is about uh, fossil fuel uh, financing in general. Uh, second uh, question is concerning uh, gas financing. And third uh, uh, question was about uh, uh, summer and also uh, hydro, you know, in, in the context of uh, uh, Western energy uh, issues. Uh, okay, uh, for your first question concerning fossil fuel financing, uh, first of all, uh, as you know, ADB has not uh, financed the coal uh, fired energy since 2013. Uh, 2013 was the last year we did finance uh, coal fired energy and commit uh, to support the developing member countries with clean and reliable energy. So, concerning coal, uh, as you know, once again, uh, while our new energy policy is currently being consulted with our stake shareholders and also stakeholders, including uh, you. Uh, CSOs. And actually, I don't want to uh, preempt any decision of our board. Uh, we are having a finalizing uh, this revision of our energy policy uh, uh, by uh, the timing of COP26 uh, this year. Uh, but uh, ADB, I can tell you that ADB will seriously consider exploring a formal withdrawal uh, from financing new coal power uh, generation and heating. Concerning gas, uh, regarding natural gas, we recognize uh, that supporting natural gas projects uh, in DMCs as a transition, as a transition uh, towards more renewable sources of energy are not necessarily against the Paris goals, uh, because natural gas can depress coal to reduce carbon em emissions, increase access to clean cooking and heating, and play a balancing role uh, to support uh, intermittent renewable energy. However, however, our future support for natural gas uh, will be subject to very strict screening criteria so that investments are consistent with natural, uh, national long-term low carbon pathways and avoid uh, long-term uh, carbon locking in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, Deleted with about the Paris Agreement, Paris Alignment Initiative, uh, as you know, uh, ADB together with other MDPs uh, jointly consulted uh, stakeholders in November 2020, and ADB especially uh, also engaged on the topic uh, with the NGO forum uh, during a, a dialogue in December 2020. Uh, we understand CSO's main concern is how these efforts are being reflected in ADB's new energy policy, which I mentioned. As I have indicated earlier, ADB is developing uh, implementation guidelines uh, that will enable our operations to align uh, with the goals of Paris Agreement. And ADB is trying to announce uh, when we will achieve uh, Paris Alignment by COP26 in November this year. Uh, but the <clears throat> waste to energy support, uh, we consider that support for the uh, circular economy uh, including waste to energy as one option, uh, is also likely to continue, depending on the final decision by the board, of course, on the new energy policy. Waste to energy provides opportunities uh, for integrated cross-sectorial uh, sectoral uh, projects, targeting the livelihoods of the poorest of the poor are working in waste value chain, for example, in recycling. It also enhances livability and health by removing the environmental uh, hazards caused by open waste uh, dumping. So while we recognize the concern, your concern on emission of greenhouse gas and other hazardous material from the incineration of the waste, uh, it is important uh, to recognize that incineration is a last resort. And there are many, many productive uses for waste before the final small fraction may be turned into energy. 
Um, one final word on uh, hydro. Uh, there will be a uh, Z, you know, uh, uh, large hydro. Uh, th th that issue will be addressed once again in the ongoing energy policy uh, review. And I welcome the ongoing dialogue with uh, the forum members and, and you on this. ADB considers geothermal and hydropower energy as renewable energy sources, as well, solar, as, well as solar, wind, and ocean energy. Uh, based on wide strategic environment assessment and comprehensive due diligence and the safeguards, of course, are undertaken. Uh, for our all our hydropower projects. For large or complex projects, we often include uh, the uh, engagement of international panel of independent experts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, those answers. And we will continue to engage with the energy policy review in the, in the coming uh, months. Um, and also we expect some radical changes in, in the ADB's view uh, moving towards the, re the renewable pathway uh, because of climate emergency. So I, my second set of questions are related to the safeguard policy context. In the upcoming ADB safeguard policy review, the ADB also ensure that stakeholder engagement plan for un upcoming safeguard review will ensure the civil society and the project affected community voices be meaningfully consulted throughout the process, keeping in mind the need for on-site on field investigations, face-to-face -face dialogues when pandemic restrictions are lifted. Uh, during the pandemic, we understand you cannot do the field visits, but, but without um, such kind of consultations, it's very hard to learn uh, what has happened on the ground. So on that context, I want to ask a few questions. Mr. President, can you commit to the upcoming policy review will not dilute existing safeguards? This is a very important question for us. With over 80 million US dollars spent on the CSS strengthening, ADB has not been able to implement CSS use in Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, Kyrgyzstan, and any other country. Can the ADB commit to upholding its own SPS policy until CSS reaches equivalency after due assessment? How can the new SPS ensure that financial intermediaries and private sector borrowers be brought to a strict compliance on ADB safeguard policy and the ADB accountability mechanism? In the light of ongoing review of SPS, what legacy under your presidency you can deliver for ensuring ILO co-convention co co um, and occupational standard will be directly referenced in the new SPS. Thank you, Mr. President. Could, could I ask the, the forum, Ryan, could you also intervene with uh, uh, your statement or any, any questions? I'm conscious of time. There are um, quite a lot of questions coming in externally, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll just go right to it, uh, Mr. President, and glad to finally see you and speak to you for the first time. Um, I'll bring to your attention three particular ADB finance projects where we are uh, dealing with compensation and land acquisition uh, complications on the ground. The first one is the Tanaho hydropower project in Nepal, which is currently an OSPF complaint. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, there have been delayed uh, investigations. OSPF could not get on the ground and do the necessary uh, assessments of the complaint. Uh, in the meantime, Construction of a dam is currently underway. So the local communities uh, who work with the NGO forum along with local NGO partners are basically calling for a suspension of the project construction amid this pandemic until the grievances um, have been addressed, which include land for land compensation, uh, redress for impacts on collective resources and properties. So this is from the uh, affected Magar community in Nepal. The second project I want to bring your attention to is in India. It's the Kolkata Environmental Improvement Investment Project, Tranche 2. Uh, there are multiple street vendors who sell tea and um, uh, electrical shops and such. These street vendors have been displaced because of the construction of the water and drainage pipes being laid in, um, in the road project. Um, and this has resulted in a loss of livelihood. Originally, the construction was supposed to be for three months and the compensation was supposed to be provided for three months and that was back in 2019. 
Construction is still ongoing and the project has been delayed. So the pandemic hit and all of a sudden uh, these, uh, these shopkeepers could not put their shops back on. Some by 2021 were brave enough to put their shops back on, but local project developers um, and uh, extremely aggressive in, in an aggressive manner had forced them to evict again. So we, we definitely seek rightful compensation for the total loss of period for the number of months of their livelihood, which has now extended to over a year. And uh, this, this displacement would not have happened if ADB had not financed the project. So we definitely would seek your oversight in this matter urgently. The situation is very dire in India, as you know. Uh, the last project is in Mongolia. It's the Gair Area Development Investment Program and Affordable Housing Urban Renewal Project. It's been an OSPF complaint since 2018. Uh, many affected communities, I think in our estimates, 3,000 to 500 people have been affected in resettlement. Some cash compensations have been given, but the problem is right now more and more people are being affected by this project. And the issue is actually around land compensation. The communities are calling for land for land compensation with the same title or an adequate size apartment so that the families can live uh, with the financial support. As you understand, the Mongolian winter is very harsh. It's minus 40 degrees. So when they were resettled into tents, a lot of people got sick, especially women and young children. So it's not just cash compensation. It will just not do. Uh, secondly, on this project, the OSPF did help reach a memorandum of understanding in 2018, which allowed for compensation and which would have been agreeable by the people. But this 2018 MOU was never implemented. Even now, we filed a second complaint. The MOU is still unrecognized. So these are, these are areas which will require oversight. And I just want to stress that it's a pandemic scenario. And these are the communities who do not have the luxuries which we even enjoy as civil society. So the urgent response in this matter will be highly encouraged. Thank you, sir, for your time. Okay, thank, thank you, Hamantha and, and uh, um, uh, Ryan. Maybe, Mr. President, I can quickly summarize in the interest of time, um, uh, asking for a commitment in the safeguards review that we, ADB will not be diluting our safeguards. Uh, and the three projects which Ryan has, has brought up, uh, um, the challenges of uh, engaging uh, and, um, our, with our safeguards during the COVID-19. Um, if you could respond to those two, two issues very, very uh, briefly, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Hermansa, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, well, about uh, uh, Hemans uh, has a uh, strong interest in SPS. Thank you very much for, for your strong interest, of course. Uh, as, you, uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, ADB management initiated uh, the uh, policy uh, review and uh, update process in August 2020 following uh, corporate evaluation of the SPS uh, safeguard policy statement uh, by ADB's uh, IED, Independent Evaluation Department, in May uh, last year. And it, it's expected to be completed in March uh, 2023. To ensure meaningful consultation and communication in the review process, uh, with a draft stakeholders engagement plan, SCP, is already available uh, for public comments on the ADB website, as, as you mentioned. Uh, we will undertake a stakeholder consultation to cover project affected people, CSOs, uh, government officials, and the private sector. Uh, representatives from both DMCs and non-DMCs to ensure ADB uh, incorporates a range of different perspectives into the new uh, policy review. Uh, we have already had uh, the, uh, quite intensive discussions with CSOs, including the NGO forum on ADB uh, to feed into the CP. Uh, we have committed to extend uh, this uh, review process to March uh, 2023, recognizing the current difficulties in undertaking person-to-person, -person, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, meetings uh, with uh, uh, local grassroots, CSOs, you, affected persons, uh, vulnerable uh, groups, and including indigenous uh, people due to the current pandemic situation. Uh, the dilution of standards 
uh, expanded use of CSS, country safeguard systems, and also expanding private sector portfolio and use of FIs, financial intermediaries. Uh, these are all very important points uh, you raised uh, related to the ongoing uh, safeguard policy statements review. I can assure you that uh, ADB has no intention, no zero intention to diluting our safeguards, uh, which we recognize as a significant value add to our operations. During the review, we will undertake uh, stakeholder consultations to cover project affected people and so on, CSOs and so on. And we are also conducting a series of specific studies of ADB safeguard activities and global good practice, uh, which will feed into the review. Uh, we will specifically look at country safeguard system, uh, as you mentioned, CSS, our private sector portfolios and financial intermediaries, FI, uh, which you correctly uh, raise and as important. So let me also stress now that the use of CSS on FI uh, does not relieve uh, ADB of its due diligence and uh, loan supervision responsibilities. And it does not alter the role of ADB, ADB's accountability mechanism. Similarly, a public or private sector a project have to adhere fully uh, to ADB's uh, safeguard standards. Uh, concerning the uh, alliance uh, issue addressed by alliance, uh, you know, uh, actually he quoted uh, uh, the three uh, concrete uh, projects. So I agree, uh, we acknowledge, uh, we agree that the meaningful consultations are very challenging uh, during uh, this uh, the pandemic period. And however, uh, we are uh, very much committed to fulfilling our safeguard requirements, and we emphasize that meaningful uh, consultation and grievance uh, redress mechanisms must be implemented in full. In full. Uh, let me share uh, some of the steps taken by ADBs under the pandemic concerning uh, two projects uh, you mentioned. Uh, we are testing and using where appropriate adaptive mechanism mechanisms such as online tools, uh, form-based apps, uh, drones, uh, social media, et cetera, to conduct public consultations and manage uh, project grievance uh, redress mechanisms. Uh, in uh, Tanahu, uh, Nepal, uh, where the community is remote and does not have access to internet, uh, we were able to connect uh, with communities using do, Zoom uh, via a satellite internet uh, connection, satellite internet connection, facilitated by the ne uh, Nepal Resident Mission. We also have a national uh, team on the uh, ground engaging the uh, compre uh, complainants and their supporting NGOs, including an uh, anthropologist, a mediator, and a uh, Magal IP uh, specialist. In Mongolia jail areas, which you also mentioned, uh, where there is a generally a good access to internet, we did provide a training for our complainant, our complainants on how to use Zoom, and we have made sure affected people had access to laptops. With the support of the OSPF, a national facilitator, negotiations with complainants are progressing well, and several cases have already been closed. And uh, all in all, the special uh, project facilitator, uh, Warren Evans, and his team are closely monitoring progress uh, on these and other current cases and engaging uh, virtually on a regular basis. So we would welcome further advice from you, CSOs, uh, on your experience and good practice approaches. Thank you very much for your valuable input. Okay, thank you very much uh, um, from the NGO Forum, Ryan and, and Hamantha. Uh, and for President Massa in your, your responses there. I would point out uh, um, uh, during the civil society program of the, uh, this annual meeting, the forum is uh, um, leading two sessions, uh, one tomorrow on civil society reflections on COVID-19 and on Wednesday in reviewing ADB's energy policy to meet the Paris, Paris goals. So we, we hope that there will be a good attendance from uh, those participating today. And I thank the forum for, for leading the, those two uh, um, sessions. Um, so let, let me move, move on now to uh, one of our, our long-term partners, um, WWF from um, the 
uh, this year, ADB is celebrating 20 years of partnership uh, with, with them. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce, as a trusted partner, uh, Catherine Custodio, who is the executive director um, based here in the, the Philippines. Uh, Catherine, please. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you and good afternoon, President Massa. WBF celebrated a special anniversary last week, our 60th, making us just a few years older than the ADB. And as Chris said, this year also marks the 20th anniversary of our partnership, under which we've collaborated in areas ranging from coral reef conservation to tracking environmental degradation across the region. And lately, we've been working on reducing plastic waste pollution and other aspects of blue economy. And I'd like to invite you and all participants to join the event immediately after this one on how improved coastal and marine resource management can contribute to a green, resilient, and equitable COVID-19 recovery. The region has indeed seen tremendous economic progress during the lives of our organizations. But tragically, this has been accompanied by a rapid decline in the health and breadth of our ecosystems, such as forests, wetlands, mangroves, and coral reefs. These natural ecosystems are vital to our livelihoods and resiliency, regulating water, pollinating crops, providing ecotourism jobs, and much more. Deforestation is also a major contributor to global carbon emissions. And the region is moving far too slowly to reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. The science tells us that 2020 is the year we must begin to turn these trends around by accelerating action on biodiversity loss and climate change. ADB has made environment one of its core pillars in its 2030 strategy approved in 2018. Operational Priority 3, OP3, focuses on tackling climate change, building climate and disaster resilience, and enhancing environmental sustainability. It also highlights that to sustain economic growth, ADB's developing country members must tackle natural capital degradation and decline, including biodiversity loss. Uh, OP3 acknowledges that the region's high biodiversity supports the region's economies and delivers a range of goods and services that sustain livelihoods, support food production, provide water and energy security, and provides resilience to climate and disaster risks. It highlights the importance of aligning ADB operations and support to developing member countries to the CDD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So my question to you, President Massa, as the bank is currently working on its biodiversity strategy and roadmap, what assurance can ADB provide to Asia-Pacific NGOs and countries that the strategy will be transforming the bank's portfolio of projects and investments at a scale that we need to reverse biodiversity loss. So how can the ADB be much more aggressive in addressing the causes and impacts of climate change and nature loss? For example, will you require that COVID-19 recovery funding must support ecosystem health? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for, 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 for those questions. Uh, first, let me start with uh, you know ADB's uh, involvement, uh, investment uh, in uh, healthy oceans, natural capital, uh, or ADB's uh, our, our you know climate commitments. Uh, of course, uh, uh, ADB recognizes it's a very long time uh, partnership for twenty years uh, with uh, WWF and your significant contribution to advancing ADB's knowledge and operations. Uh, related to sustainable infrastructure, nature-based uh, solutions, uh, blue economy, and water resources management, biodiversity in general. Uh, we, we look forward to continue collaboration, uh, very uh, close collaboration in these important areas. Um, as I mentioned earlier, under Strategy 2030, ADB is committed to reach 80 billion in cumulative climate financing for 2019 to 2030 and to ensure uh, that 75% of our total number of operations contribute, con contribute uh, to mitigation and or adaptation by 2030. 
Our work on climate change adaptation and resilience includes addressing a nature loss and enhancing uh, nature conservation to help the region uh, achieve interlinked goals uh, for climate and biodiversity. Uh, let me highlight, uh, first of all, two areas where ADP is working to address uh, nature loss and con conservation. Firstly, on healthy oceans and blue economy uh, programs, our action plan for healthy oceans and sustainable blue economies aims to expand our financing for ocean health and the blue economy to $5 billion uh, between 2019 and 2024. Under the uh, uh, current action plan, we are focusing on three main areas, reducing plastic pollution, improving coastal resilience, and enabling blue uh, finance. On reducing plastic uh, pollution, our programs emphasize policy reform, uh, national and city level action plans, investment preparation, capacity building, and uh, innovative finance. Um, currently, we are focusing in Indonesia, PRC, China, uh, Philippines, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. On coastal resilience, the ADB WWF uh, partnership is looking at opportunities for uh, raising awareness, uh, coastal planning, and nature based solutions uh, to climate change, as well as larger scale investment for wetlands, mangroves, and coral reefs. Our work includes a focus on Indonesia, Pakistan, and the Pacific. On blue finance, ADB has developed an ocean finance framework and ocean health and biodiversity are added as one of the funding areas for Asian Development Fund, ADF. In addition, we launched the Asian Catalytic Green Finance Facility, ACGFF, which is supporting the development of bankable blue and green projects. Uh, secondly, on natural capital investments, uh, sorry, uh, natural capital investments uh, by ADB, uh, we are developing an ADB uh, nat uh, nature positive investment roadmap and a regional uh, natural capital lab, expanding on our experiences in East Asia and the Mekong sub region. This lab and an associated financing facility will catalyze much needed investment design uh, to support biodiversity, while at the same uh, timing addressing climate change, improving food security, and generating green jobs. Finally, uh, biodiversity in general. Uh, the Asian Pacific region has the most diverse ecosystems in the world, as you know. So they support uh, the region's economies and people's livelihood and provide resilience against climate change and disasters. But they are under severe stress right now. Uh, ADB is stepping up our efforts to support countries to tackle ecosystems degradation and biodiversity losses. Uh, we are in the process of developing what we call a, a nature positive investment roadmap, which aims to enable uh, nature positive investment to be scaled up. This roadmap will also help align nature and climate agendas in the run up to biodiversity COP15 in October and the Climate COP26 in November. Uh, finally, relatedly, uh, we are also stepping up our work on ocean health, blue economy, and marine uh, richer, as, as I, I already mentioned. I hope I answered your question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for uh, joining us today, and uh, President Massa for uh, responding to that, that, that question. I am conscious of time. We were hoping to get uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Eva Dutari from uh, the Global um, um, Civil Society Organization, ISEC, the world's largest youth-led organization, but uh, we've, we've had technical is issues there, and, uh, um, but I, I do have an advanced copy of the uh, question from um, ISEC. Um, ISEC is, is the world's largest youth-led organization with over 40,000 members uh, active in 120 countries, including um, active chapters in, in some 500 universities. Uh, ADB has had a, a, a partnership agreement with ISEC since 2015 uh, to work and bring young people into, into ADB's operations. Um, and I understand the question uh, that young people of the region were um, 
very, very interested in was uh, President Massa to um, share his views on how young people can meaningfully engage in ADB's operations and how can we as a bank work with young people for um, uh, contributing to the sustainable development goals. Chris and Eva, uh, we, we, we miss you, uh, but uh, thank you for your insights and uh, raising uh, these very important issues. Uh, ADB's youth uh, for Asia Initiative has benefited greatly from the partnership with ISEC uh, since 2015 uh, in bringing uh, young people into our operations, particularly local DMC uh, youth, including the vulnerable and marginalized. ADB will continue uh, to, to prioritize investing in young human capital uh, through education and health programs, social protection, and quality jobs, especially for the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. Uh, mo moreover, given that low-income countries have relatively larger youth population, uh, we do recognize uh, the region will only recover quickly if young people are productive assets for our DMCs. ADB's Youth for Asia Initiative, which partners uh, with ISEC, is a good example of meaningful youth engagement since it involves intergenerational partnerships with young people in project design work across ADB's operations departments. For example, in uh, 2018, 123 uh, youth ambassadors from 25 provinces led a project on improving financial literacy and access to financial services in Indonesia. Young people were chief implementers of the research and advocacy campaigns leading to youth pin sites. The biggest ever survey of young people on financial inclusion in Asia Pacific. The project was instrumental in informing the development of the Indonesian government's national youth financial inclusion strategy. I encourage such participation of young minds as partners of ADB working towards a resilient, inclusive, and green recovery across the region. We definitely see the potential to increase meaningful youth engagement in ADB's operations and knowledge work, focusing on the vulnerable and the marginalized population. On the SDGs, ADB sees localizing the SDGs as, as, as an essential driver for accelerated results. And this must include our local young citizens uh, who have the innovation and the drive to take action. I want to see ADB working uh, with our DMCs, supporting more youth organizations to create genuinely innovative ideas and to support replication and upscaling. I once again thank Isaac and other youth organizations committed to the SDGs and the development of the region you are a good example of youth leadership and active partners, which the region needs as countries bounce back from the pandemic. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, President Massa. I'm conscious we only have two minutes left, so we're not going to go to, to the, the, the Q&A. Uh, I do apologize. It is certainly more challenging uh, trying, trying to moderate a session virtually with civil society. I much prefer the, the in-person and I hope that uh, in the future we can, we can continue our collaborations and in, in engagement uh, uh, in, in person. I would uh, like to thank uh, Rubab, uh, uh, Hamantha, uh, Ryan and Catherine for joining us, us today. Um, can I conclude by encouraging all participants here today to register and join the rest of the civil society program this week. Uh, it is led by uh, civil society organizations. We have five, five sessions. Um, the first of which is led by WWF, as Catherine ind indicated, uh, entitled Collaboration for a Resilient and Green Recovery. Um, uh, realizing the potential of a sustainable blue economy. And this, this session starts actually here online in 30 minutes. So we just have time for a, for a quick uh, break. President Massa, can I turn to you for any final words uh, very quickly as we have less than a minute? All right. Uh, well, civil society organizations, CSOs have very unique strengths. 
uh, which can be variable for ADB uh, to enhance uh, its development effectiveness uh, at the project level and also at the policy level, both of uh, levels. So CSO engagement is a continuous process uh, which goes on year around. And in this regard, I am very pleased uh, to see a keen interest and engagement from CSOs in ADB's work. And I greatly appreciate your valuable input. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for all the participants today, particularly those who have joined online. So from ADB headquarters here in Manila, I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you for joining. Uh, stay safe and healthy with your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, Chris. thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Bye -bye.